The Children's Television Workshop presents Square One TV, show number 158, produced at Unitel Video in New York. in. 5% of the population of Dallas is more people than 100% of the population of Grasshopper Gulch, and it has its own TV show on another network. It'll never last. Film at 11. Callus, the story of the family that baby ruthlessly took over the candy industry in Texas. The story of J.B. Jellybean Callus and his worthless low-down relatives. Let's join a few of the scuzzy ones. J.B. Jellybean Callus, his wife Sue Becky, and their daughter Becky Sue have just arrived in Grasshopper Gulch, Texas. It's J.B.'s hometown and site of a strange lack of interest in Callus Candy Company's new line of gumdrops. J.B., I don't understand why we had to come here to Grasshopper Gulch. Now, Sue Becky, I'm gonna go over this just one more time for you. You see this? This here's a sales chart. It's a sales chart for a callous can of gumdrops. It's semi-irritating. But why, Daddy? I thought the sale of callous can of gumdrops was just peachy. Oh, really? They are? Why, sure. More than 60% of the people in Houston and Waco are buying your gumdrops, Daddy. And almost the same amount in Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin. Oh, El Paso's a little down, but Daddy, you know El Paso. Uh-huh. Well, why don't you just keep it going, darling dearest, and look at my very own hometown of Grasshopper Gulch. Would you just look at those sales? It's disgusting, and it makes me feel like a failure. I think you're overreacting. Well, if they let me have a six-gun on this show, I'd show you overreacting. Daddy, Daddy, please remember your heart condition. Well, your daddy doesn't have a heart, child. That's a lump of coal. Well, thank you, darling. Now, I think we better get to the bottom of this here candy mystery. Becca Sue, why don't you fan out and take a survey? A survey? That's right. I want you to interview the fine citizens of Grasshopper Gulch and find out why my gumdrops aren't selling. Well, Daddy, what do we do first? Well, I guess we better just freeze frame and let that flannel mouth announce a talk. Well, what will the town's good people tell the Callus family about their candy? Will they get some good information or will the Calluses have to take matters into their own hands? Stay tuned for the next exasperating episode of Callus. Mrs. Tuttle doesn't know she's on our hidden camera. I've got a headache. It starts at the top of my head, roller skates to my forehead, then dribbles down my nose, hangs a louis to my left earlobe, and then break dances down my neck. It sounds like a data headache. I have a data headache. Too much information on her monthly budget and no way to organize it. Oh, sure. I love numbers and figures, but sometimes they just give me a headache. If only I could see how they relate to each other. Will you try a bar graph? A bar graph? A quick, easy way to organize and display data. I'll try it. Bar graph. Just one of the many tables, charts, and graphs available to you anytime, anywhere. When in doubt, chart it out. My headache's gone, and now I can see what my monthly budget looks like. Thank you, Bar Graph. Daddy, Mama, I think I know why the gumdrops aren't selling. 
in here. Well, now you just catch your breath, darling, and you fill us in. What did you find out, dear? Well, I went over to the women's sewing circle meeting over there. I asked every member what they thought of callous candy gumdrops. Well, how many were there? Well, I made some marks on my pad for everybody I talked to. Well, now, how many is that? Well, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. You know, Becky Sue, there's a way of doing that that makes it a whole lot easier to count. You could make marks on your pad in groups of five. See, like this. For every fifth person, you make a slash. Then you can tell that you talk to 14 people a whole lot quicker. At a glance, you can count in groups of fives and ones. Thanks, Mama. That's right useful information, but I feel that we're slipping away from a dramatic storyline. Right you are, daughter. Now, why don't you tell us what those women of the sewing circle said? Well, Daddy, you're not gonna like this, but five of them said that they didn't like gumdrops, period. The other nine said they didn't like the shape of the box. Seeing as they were members of a sewing circle, they said that they'd prefer a round box. Well, now, that is the silliest thing I've ever heard. But if that's what the citizens of Grasshopper Gulch want, well, then that's what I'll give them. Far be it from me to deny the public. Well, now, just hold your rocking horse, J.B. You can't base your opinions on what 14 members of the sewing circle said. And why not? They were telling the truth, weren't they? Oh, well, I guess they were, but they're only 14 people. They're not representative of town opinion. The women's sewing circle is not what you call a fair sample. There weren't any men and there weren't any children, were there, Becky Sue? No, ma'am. J.B., how many people are in this town? Oh, about a thousand, I reckon. <laughs> well, you can't make a decision about a thousand people based on the opinion of 14 members of the women's sewing circle. Well, now, darling, what am I supposed to do? Interview every single person in this whole gall darn town? I know. We'll spread out across town and interview every second person we meet for the next two hours. That'll give us a good sample of town opinion, say about 150 people or so. Then we'll compare our notes and study the data. Well, now, that is a good idea. In fact, here comes someone right now. Excuse me, sir. Well, hey, Daddy. Guess who? It's me, your missing maverick son, Billy Don. Why, you can't be Billy Don, boy. You don't even look like him. That's because when I mysteriously vanished, I had a mysterious accident, and I underwent plastic surgery at the hands of a mysterious doctor. Huh. Well, now, if you are Billy Don, as you say you are, what did I get you for your third birthday? Well, shucks, Daddy. You bought me a judge. Well, you're Billy Don, all right. Son, there's a question I'd like to ask you about callous candy gumdrops. Shoot. You can't ask Billy Don, Daddy. Then why not? Well, because he's family. And he also doesn't live in Grasshopper Gulch, and he can't be a part of this survey. Well, all right, all right. I guess you can't be a part of this survey. But I tell you what, why don't you take this here pad why don't you get yourself your own pad and hit the streets and help me find out with the survey why my gumdrops are such a flop here. Hmm, sounds like fun. I think it's time that I disappear mysteriously once again. Perhaps I'll come back next season as an evil twin. Goodbye, y'all. Well, now you come back here, Billy Don. Oh, well. As the sun slowly sets in Grasshopper Gulch, the Callus family survey gets underway. Will they learn why there's a gumdrop gap in Grasshopper Gulch? Stick around. There'll be more Callus in just a few minutes. Mr. Dupinney doesn't know he's on our hidden camera. I got a headache. I tell you right about now. Six. Overweight elephants are playing soccer with my eyeballs. It sounds like a data headache. Mm-hmm. I got a data headache. Too much information and no way to organize it. I was driving my cab, see, minding my own business when... BAM! I got hit from behind by a truckload of numbers. Gas, repairs, parking, tickets. I almost went through the windshield. Will you try a pie chart? A pie chart? A quick, easy way to organize and display data. I'll try it. Pie chart. Just one of the many tables, charts, and graphs available to you anytime, anywhere. When in doubt, chart it out. Hey. The elephants are gone. I feel fantastic. The pie chart 
put all those numbers in an organized form. And now, for the first time in my life, I understand all my costs. Will you use pie charts in the future? Does the chicken have lips? Ooh, what does that have to do with anything? I don't know. And now for the exciting conclusion of Callus. J.B. Jellybean Callus and his family are completing a survey of Grasshopper Gulch, J.B.'s birthplace. They're determined to get to the bottom of the curious lack of gumdrop sales in that tiny little town. Why aren't these people buying my gumdrops? Well, first of all, J.B., some people in Grasshopper Gulch are buying your gumdrops. We interviewed 150 people, and 8% of them said they like them just fine. Say they're better than Black Eyed Peas on New Year's. Why, look, Daddy. That's just about the same percentage as the one you got on this chart you had made. Fine, darling, but what about the other 92%? Well... 6% said they didn't like the shape of the box. 12% said they didn't like the taste. 6% said they didn't like callous candy gumdrops because they didn't stick to the movie screen when you threw them like a good gumdrop should. 10% said they wouldn't eat anything made by you, JB. And 58% said they didn't like them because they're just too sweet and sugary. You know, I'm not sure I follow you. Well, read it and weep. Is it clear now? I'll say it's clear. A picture speaks louder than a thousand words. It seems to me that the principal reason that the good citizens of Grasshopper Gulch do not want to eat my gumdrops is because they're too sugary. Right. But that just doesn't make sense to me. Now, why would these people in Grasshopper Gulch be different than the rest of the state of Texas? Well, now, I thought about that too, JB. So I went to the public library and I found this book. A Short History of Grasshopper Gulch. Read the sentence I put the paper clip next to on page 168. 168. All right, here it is. Grasshopper Gulch was founded in 1828 by a group of 12 dentists who were frustrated by too many cavities back east. Read on. Over the years, they taught the principles of good oral hygiene to their descendants. To this day, the citizens of Grasshopper Gulch remain a people who take very good care of their teeth. Well, that's real interesting, Sue Becky. And it explains my pearly white smile, but I, uh... Well, don't you see, J.B.? 58% of the people in Grasshopper Gulch who don't buy your gumdrops say it's because they're too sweet. That's because they're afraid all that sugar's gonna ruin the teeth. So you see, Daddy, all you have to do is come up with a brand of gumdrops that's sugar-free. And I bet lots of people will buy them even outside of Grasshopper Gulch. Well, I've got just the slogan. Sugar-free gumdrops? Sure, we got them. Or they'll stick to your teeth, but they sure won't rot them. Oh, that is truly horrible, JB. Thank you, darling. You make me blush. When I have trouble deciding which percents are less than one half, I get some help from my animated buddy, Math Man. <laughs> Your mission is to eat only percents that are less than one half. When you encounter a number, you'll have until the count of three to make your decision. And beware the horrific Mr. Click. He will eat you if you are wrong. Math man, math man, math man, math man, math man. Less than one half. What did I happen to me? Math man, math man, math man. Less than one half. Math man, math man, math man, math man, math man. Very dry. Pretty small. All right. Math man, 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 math man. I don't know. Tough call. Yep. Oh. Math man, math man, math man, math man, math. He seldom learns. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! There they are, my three beautiful smokestacks, built of myself. Now, if I could only find out who put dynamite under them, that's the craziest thing I ever heard. I'm going to have to unwire this detonator. Howie, uh, Daddy built those smokestacks, and somebody put dynamite charges under them, and I've got to take the wires from this detonator. Whatever you do, Howie, uh, honey, don't push the button. <laughs>
Howie, uh, you're probably going to spend about the next six months in your room for doing that. Now Daddy only has two of the three smokestacks left. That's two-thirds of what he had to begin with. Just keep... I need the smokestacks. That's why I built three because I wanted three, and I don't have two, and I don't care why they do this to me. Well, two-thirds is better than... I don't know what to do with it. it. Maybe I should just put my hand over this so that nobody can, can push it. That should protect that, because the one thing I've got to do is keep <laughs> these remaining... Two. Uh, you have blown up Daddy's smokestack. I just hate it when she does that. That leaves me with one-third of the number that I began with. Well, one smokestack is enough if a man lives his life conservatively. All I have to do is take this wire off, and I think this will probably neutralize the terminal A. Are they going to get it when I get home? Keep him over there. Put him in the car. I, five minutes at the most. I just don't want anyone ruining this last smoke. And zero over three is no thirds. No thirds of the smokestacks I began with. Right, back to the drawing board. Hey, just think. This much of the show is gone, leaving this much to come. So, let it come. Hmm. That's the 37th elephant I've seen this week. I think I'll keep a record of how many elephants I see each week. I'll put the number of elephants I see here and the weeks down here. Aha! That makes 12 elephants this week. Hmm. I'll just draw a line down to 12 on the second week. Let's see now. That makes 25 elephants this week. Aha! I'll draw the line up to 25 the third week. Hey, this is fun. Hmm, that's odd. I haven't seen any elephants this week. Uh, make that one elephant. One very large elephant. You're carrying round a diagram. Now, girl, please tell us why. It shows how much in love I am as each new month rolls by. Here, let me explain. Do you remember how he smiled at me on the very first day of school? Just check September on my graph, you'll see he got five points for acting cool. Woo -woo. He wore a pony costume on Halloween, gave a maid cause we had such fun. But Thanksgiving Day he treated me real mean, so I only gave the turkey one. My heart's in a changing state. It made my Christmas merry But a New Year's Eve He took our Mary Jo Gave him zero for January On Valentine's Day He washed his hair He said, girl, I did it just for you I said, hey, you got a flair For personal care And boy, you've earned a great big two One year of this love of mine Right here on this broken line Hey, 
and looks like you'll go steady soon. Just plans, I've been strapped, my friend. Romance shows an upward trend. I'm singing the praises of a thing called the graph of love. The graph of love. Yeah, 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 yeah. The graph of love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The graph of love. Yeah, 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 yeah. The graph of love. Yeah, yeah. The graph of love. Yeah, yeah. The graph of love. Miss Weatherby doesn't know she's on our hidden camera. I have acquired a headache. The sensation is not unlike the playing of three kettle drums in a compact car. Boom ba boom ba boom ba boom ba boom boom. You get the idea. It sounds like a data headache. I have acquired a data headache. Mm hmm. Too much information and no way to organize it. Corporate profits are numbers to be reckoned with, I know, but every once in a while they make me very, very ill. Will you try a line graph? A line graph? Mm-hmm. A quick, easy way to organize and display data. I will try it. Line graph. Just one of the many tables, charts, and graphs available to you anytime, anywhere. When in doubt, chart it out. The pounding is gone. I'm overjoyed. By putting information on a line graph, I can clearly see how my company's profits change over time. Will you use line graphs in the future? I certainly will. And thank you for your help. Now, what can you suggest for Ring Around the Collar? The story you are about to see is a fib, but it's short. The names are made up, but the problems are real. 9.43 a.m. and traffic was nose to nose because the recent Santa Ana winds had dried up every nasal passage in the valley. We were working the day watch out of MathNet. My partner is George Frankly. The boss is Thad Green. My name is Monday. I'm a mathematician. We had been working on a bizarre case which involved the theft of three truckloads of dirt. The trucks were returned. The dirt was not. We decided to look at a scene from yesterday's show to refresh our memories. It's good to think hard about problems, especially hard problems. They may have dumped it somewhere up here. Abandoned gravel pits. Gravel pits. They could have dumped it there and no one would ever notice. Let's get out there. After searching the abandoned gravel pit to no avail, we finally spotted something unusual. We decided to take a closer look. What do you make of it, Kate? Someone was digging here. It's as though they were looking for something. What if the dirt isn't valuable? Uh-huh. What if something that is valuable was, was buried, buried in, in the, the dirt? dirt? Hi, Kate. I just gave George the lab report on the new dirt. It has the same composition as the old dirt, Kate. Uh-huh. Debbie, we think something valuable was buried in the dirt. We need to know it was standing on the site before the hole was dug. Can you check with the Bureau of Records? You got it. I'll call Mr. Rourke and make sure no other trucks have been stolen. Mr. Rourke, George Frankly, MathNet. Any more trouble at the excavation site, sir? Nothing? No more trucks missing? I see. Thank you, sir. Kate, I think we can make an assumption. What's that? Whoever was sifting through the dirt found what he was looking for. Monday. Yes, Debbie. I see. Got a new address on them? Thanks. George, there was a housing project on the site. We've got the name of the couple that lived there before the excavation. Let's roll. A couple named Swaggle had lived in the house that occupied the site and they had just recently moved into a new home. We decided to pay a call and introduce ourselves. Yes? Mrs. Swaggle, I'm Kate Monday. This is my partner, George. Frankly, MathNet. Land the Goshen, what do you want with little old me? <laughs> just wonder if you could answer a couple of questions about your former residence. Is this some sort of door-to-door -door game show or something? 
Oh, I hope. I was almost kissed by Richard Dawson once. On Family Feud? No. Mrs. Swaggo, was there anything unusual about your house? Anything at all? Not that you'd notice. It was just a little cracker box of a house. Two bedrooms and a bath and a quarter and a carport. Just like all the other houses in the area. What about the landscaping? Anything unusual there? No. The front lawn was just a little postage stamp, and the back lawn was even smaller. <laughs> Mr. Swaggle used to mow it with my pinking shears. <laughs> How long did you live there, ma'am? Twenty years. Oh, it was a charming little place. We put it on the market for 350000 and it sold in less than ten minutes. <laughs> I'm happy for you. It was almost enough for a down payment on this jobby. We have reason to suspect someone may have buried something valuable on your lot. Nothing like that ever happened when we lived there. If you think of anything, please give us a call. Just one more thing, Mrs. Swaggle. Yes, young man. What's Richard Dawson really like? George. By the way, who did you buy the house from? The bank. It was a foreclosure. some info on the previous owner of the house, Math Netters. It was owned by a man named Merle Fish. He couldn't keep up the mortgage payments and the bank took it away. Merle Fish? That name rings a bell. It should. He was convicted of pulling off the famous Fink's armored car robbery about 21 years ago. He was sent to state prison. No wonder he couldn't make his mortgage payments. The Fink's armored car robbery. I studied that case in Math Net school. The guy got away with one million dollars. They caught him, but never got the money back. The theory was, if I recall, that Fish had an accomplice who got away with the money and left the country. There was a book written about it at the time, wasn't there? Yes, it was called Marilyn, a Fink's truck, written by Norman Mailbag. Is Fish still in prison? According to this, he was sentenced to 30 years. He's got nine to make. George, call the warden and see when we can talk with Mr. Fish. Debbie, call the Fink's company and see if they have records of the serial numbers of the bills. Thank you, sir. George, how'd you make out? Did you talk to the warden? Yes, I did, Kate. Can we see Merle Fish? Afraid not. The warden's a powerful man, but he's not that powerful. What do you mean? Merle Fish died in prison six days ago. can I do for you? We know you wrote the famous book about the Fink's caper. Yes, I did. And that you probably know more about the case than anyone else? I'm sure I do. I wondered, in all the years that you knew him, Mr. Mailbag, did he ever tell you what happened to the money? You didn't read my book. 100% of Square One TV is a production of the Children's Television Workshop. This program was made possible by grants from the National Science Foundation, the U.S. Department of Education, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Corporate funding is provided by IBM. At IBM, we believe education is the key to the future. We are pleased to help support Square One TV as an innovative way to introduce young people to the exciting world of mathematics.